Hi everybody, welcome to the Morpho Institute. My name is Krista Dillabaugh and I'm the current director. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to our Amazon Conservation Through Education webinar series, which we launched in 2020 in an effort to make stronger connections to the Amazon and to classrooms. Tonight's special feature is monkeying around in the Amazon. And of course the topic is going to be primates and monkeys. And our guest speaker is Dr. Katie Filan. Katie is on our faculty for the Educator Academy in the Amazon, our annual professional development program for K-12 teachers. Katie is also a primatologist and a conservation biologist and is part of the Dragonfly program at Miami University of Ohio. Katie joined us in the field in 2019 and has quickly become an integral part of our work here at the Morpho Institute. And we're just delighted to have um, the opportunity to, to share Katie with all of you. And um, she's gonna provide a wonderful overview of Amazon primates. And we'll begin to talk about how we can take that um, fun and exciting topic and integrate it into your classroom. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Katie. Thanks so much. And um, I'll see you at the end. Um, first of all, uh, I'm so happy to be here and we're going to hopefully take you on a journey and it's cold and rainy. I'm in Ohio right now. And so we are at least going to travel in our minds. Um, one thing I always like to say, I work in participatory education. Uh, and so this is as much as your presentation as mine. So. Don't wait till the end. If you have a question, uh, go ahead and unmute and um, yell it to me. Go ahead, write it in the comments. I'll see if I can pull up the comments just in case. You can be like my undergrad students and have random conversations and see if I can keep my train of thought. That's always a, a fun adventure. Uh, and then we'll try to do a couple of interactive activities. So to begin with, um, I want you all to take a journey. And so um, whether it was 2019, I see some familiar friends um, or go, go back into the Amazon and feel the heat. Um, imagine walking up in those canopy walkways as it moves with the person behind you. Hear the sounds of all the animals the birds, the insects, feel the sweat, that smell that so many of us love of sweat and mosquito repellent. Um, and just take a moment and be in that place. And forget about all the papers you're grading and everything else. Now that we're focused and we're transported there, now we're ready to learn about monkeys. So to begin with, um, we hear the term monkeys, we hear the term primates. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of background just so everyone's on the same page. Um, you know, this is something that I've been a primatologist for over 20 years now, and I still cringe because my mom can't get it straight. Uh, my dissertation was on these guys in the back and she refers to them as the ugly monkeys. Uh, so anyways, just so we're all on the page. Um, when you hear the word primate, what are some things that you think about? And you can give me some examples. Excellent jumpers, okay, great. Can anyone name some primates? Opposable thumbs, awesome. TD monkeys. We're going to see if I can do a TD monkey vocalization. I don't think I can. Yeah, so here are a couple of examples of all primates. Um, I'm old school, so I'm still going to put Brad Pitt as my example of this. Um, but primates are a general term that capture a variety of different species. And there isn't just one shared characteristic that all primates have. It's actually a suite of characteristics and most have them, but they're variable across them. Um, just so you know, we have a lemur here. Um, so anyone who's seen the movie Madagascar, that's focused on those. We have a macaque of Southeast Asia. 
an orangutan, which is an ape. So we have a monkey, an ape, and then we have us. We're actually apes. So what are some of those characteristics? Um, we're gonna start with our hands. Uh, so Megan said opposable thumb, she is right. And so uh, one of the great characteristics of primates are our ability to grasp. And so we can hold on things. I have my Inca cola here in honor of this talk in the Amazon. Um, we have a lot of dexterity in this. And then also, if you look at it, and I was doing some gardening today, um, we have nails rather than claws. And so most other mammals will actually have claws. And we've evolved these nails, which allow us to be more dexterous in there. Um, also, you notice that we have five fingers. And so this is actually a primitive trait of many different mammals, um, but we retain it in, in primates. And I'll talk about a couple of examples of things that that's a little bit different. Um, not only do most primates have opposable thumbs, they also have opposable toes, which I think would be a great characteristic. Two characteristics I wish I had, opposable toes and a prehensile tail. Uh, vision is really, really important. And so we see those eyes looking at us, forward facing eyes. And what this allows us to do is see depth. And so um, I'm very blind. And back before I taught too much and had the big bags and through my eyes, I hide with my glasses. Uh, we actually, I was in the forest um, wearing my contacts, leaf hit, popped it off. I only had one eye I could see out of. This is when all the years that I was teaching this binocular or stereoscopic 3D vision really hit. Um, we were climbing up mountains, uh, we were jumping down boulders, and I had no clue <laughs> where things were. Uh, very embarrassing when I had to go to my academic advisor and say, can you hold my hand? Because I don't know where the ground is and I don't want to uh, spill in front of you. So highly um, reliant on our vision, um, and that came out of the cost of, of our olfaction. So we don't smell as well. Um, look at your cat or your dog. Um, they have a much more pronounced snout and um, they can smell a lot better than we can. We have really large brains and so we can think about this. Um, our brains are bigger than they're expected to be for our body size. So there's a little bit of a proportion there. And then they're highly encephalized. So uh, very specialized, lots of, of thinking. And so you can see some comparisons of that. We have generalized teeth. Um, again, look at the animals in your house, and uh, we generally have four different types of teeth. I'm not going to talk about teeth, it's usually when I lose my audience, but um, I can look at teeth and tell you what species it is, what continent it came from, what its evolutionary history is, and so there's a lot of information in the teeth. But for you, we just have generalized teeth. Um, you can also learn about body size. Uh, social structure and diet all through the teeth, which is very interesting. And so we gen generally have four different types of teeth that we talk about incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. Group living. And so um, most mammals actually um, live alone and we will see aggregations of animals. Uh, we see that a lot when we're looking for birds, you'll see a large flock. Um, oftentimes those don't have interpersonal relationships and long-term relationships and they're collecting on a shared food source. Uh, but primates have these stable group structures um, and they're a very important part of who they are as a taxonomic group. We also have life in the slow lanes. And so uh, life histories are how you um, make a living, that's what I like to call it. Um, when do you reproduce? How often do you reproduce? How long you're going to live? And primates are very slow. Compare that to insects or invertebrates where you'll have um, a swarm, a nesting event with thousands of individuals. Uh, this is an orangutan. They're actually one of the slowest reproducing mammals. And so a baby orangutan will stay with his mother for every eight years, and that's about the time of interbirth interval, so very long-lived. Um, 
lots of parental care, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so let's put this all together. And so I still haven't told you what monkeys are. I'll get there. Um, so these are all primates. All primates have these characteristics in a varying sense. So in the primates, we have four main groups. We have apes, so we're an ape, and we're actually one of the great apes, so chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. Our poor gibbons are called lesser apes. Then we have two different types of monkeys. We have our old world monkeys in Africa and Asia, and our new world monkeys in Central and South America. Um, and so they have a, a set of characteristics. The big difference between this, uh, tails versus no tails, um, there's a whole other suite of characteristics. Again, those teeth. Um, the ability to swing is actually an ape trait. So you'll never see a monkey playing baseball because they just really can't get that rotation of it out. Um, and then we have our persimians. And so our lorises um, of Southeast Asia, our lemurs of Madagascar. And so across all these primates, they vary on those traits. So down here with our persimians, um, their vision isn't quite as good. It's actually, um, some species have um, a less refined vision and seen in two different colors uh, rather than the three color spectrum. And they have more presence on uh, importance of olfaction and then brain size slightly smaller. And so, you know, we like to say our brains are so big, they actually are pretty big. They're about three times the size of a chimpanzee brain. So you have all these different characteristics in here. And so um, we, of course, are going to talk about New World monkeys uh, because they're, they're just amazing. Uh, oh yeah, and then you have your other mammals in there just as kind of a comparison in here. So there is going to be a test at the end of this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so why should we study primates? Um, it, it, it's one of those things that there's so many different species that you see in the Amazon and primates are important uh, for a variety of different reasons. So first, their diversity and biomass. So depending on who you talk to, we might have uh, over 600 species of primates currently in the world. Uh, again, our invertebrate friends are going, that's nothing. Um, but they're one of the most studied taxonomic groups in the tropics. So most of the information that we get out of the tropics actually comes from uh, primatologists that are, are working on um, these species. Because they're highly diverse, we can understand how they adapt to changes and how different biological characteristics like body size, um, age of reproduction are influenced by changes in the environment. In the Amazon, uh, they compose a large percentage of the mammalian body mass. Um, so that, you know, if you take all the animals and you weigh them, that's basically what body mass is. And so uh, they play a, a very important role in that way. Next, in those roles, they also play an important role in the ecosystem. They are both predators and prey. And so from our big cats, our um, hawks and eagles to our snakes, uh, these are all things that will have primates for meals. Um, but primates eat fruits, insects, um, small birds, even small rodents, and so they're part of the food web. Besides that, they serve many different ecological functions. And so one of the most important ones um, is their role of seed dispersers. So they eat this tasty fruit, um, they then carry it around, and so they were the natural reforesters way before all of us conservationists started thinking about reforesting the forest. Because of our close evolutionary history, um, studying primates help us understand ourselves. We can model both our past evolutionary history and the traits that we've developed in that, but also it can help us learn um, 
different things about ourselves. Uh, for example, this is a study uh, from Africa that looks on cultural exchange. We actually see that in some of the species of primates. Uh, that picture that I was shown, I was working on a cultural transmission study in Costa Rica on, on capuchin monkeys. And so this helps us learn more about ourselves. <laughs> you can't have a talk in 2020 without talking about disease ecology, um, but because of their close evolutionary history, uh, primates are oftentimes spill over uh, animals. So diseases in primates come over to humans and vice versa. And as we talk about conservation, this is a bigger issue. Um, the spillover event that happened with COVID-19 um, right now isn't actually linked to a primate. However, we have other ones like Ebola, uh, they play a very big role in a lot of the vector-borne diseases like our malaria, yellow fever, uh, chikungunya, Zika. And so as we're altering uh, our interactions with the natural world, um, we're coming closer and closer into contact with uh, these animals. And there is a, a greater potential for different spillover events. Uh, tropics, uh, just a, a quick tropical ecology. Um, tropical regions have most of the biodiversity in the world and it's higher there compared to higher latitudes like where I live in Ohio. And so that translates everything from plants to mammals to also diseases. And then they're also really culturally important. Um, one of the things that's interesting as I do my work is to learn about the different stories um, ac according to um, and related to primates. Uh, the Mayahuna have a lot of very interesting ones and I'm not going to tell them for to you, but that is a, a really great um, place for them to share some of those stories. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I have my monkey dress on. And so I was able to get this at a chain store, which is pretty amazing. It has tamarins and a couple other species. Um, and just go around your day and see all the different cultural uh, icons that, that primates exist. As a primatologist, um, for years, <laughs> I get monkey socks, I have monkey ornaments, I have monkey stuffed animals. Um, and so, it, partly because of our shared evolutionary history, um, there's a lot of interest and in ultra cultural importance to this. And then finally, as a conservation biologist, I can't talk about primates without talking about their importance in conservation. And so connected to that interest, um, primates play important roles both as flagship species and umbrella species. And so for those of you that might not have heard those terms, um, flagship species are um, usually charismatic megafauna, um, fancy cool things that can encourage other people to get excited. And so our flagship species for the Morpho Institute, uh, the Morpho butterfly, also beautiful species. Uh, umbrella species are species that um, if we can save that species, we are going to save a variety of other animals that also use that area. And so, uh, for example, um, orangutans need a large chunk of land. And so if you can save that land for the orangutans inadvertently, then you're saving the lands for um, the dung beetles, you know, the plants, and everything else. Okay, so now it's your turn. We are going to do a little bit of monkey trivia. Um, go ahead and um, if you want to jot down your answers, um, we can have you write in the chat some of your answers and then I'll tell, your an tell you the correct answers later on uh, in the presentation. And so first off, what is the smallest monkey? And then a bonus question, is it the smallest primate? Okay, so remember, Monkeys are one subset of primates. Oh, pygmy marmoset. Okay. Anyone agree with Monica? And I was going to think about prizes. I should say I'll grade some of your papers. I might have made that one up. I'm not going to disagree. 
Oh, Lori. Okay. Do all monkeys have thumbs? This is when we'd have a poll, but as many of you are probably teaching online, we have some yeses, we have some noes. Interesting, okay. So there's some debate on this one. Great, I love it. Are any monkeys nocturnal? Yes, bonus points. If anyone can give the name of the nocturnal, the maybe nocturnal primate, owl monkey. Let's see, either I trained you all well in 2019. Can all monkeys hang by their tails? Nope, nope, oh, that one we have a pretty strong reaction. Older monkeys can, okay. And then, how many species of monkeys live in Peru? Any guesses? Five, eight, six, 12, 30 ish. Ooh. Interesting. Okay. So we have everything from five. I think Colleen has our highest number at 30. Okay, great. The answers will be shared later on. I think in my past life, I've always wanted to be a game show host. I don't know why. Okay, so New World Monkeys. We're in Central and South America. Uh, New World Monkeys range from Mexico all the way down to Argentina, so have a pretty large uh, extent. So everyone got this one. Uh, there's five main groups. I really like the idea of five. Uh, five main families um, in New World monkeys. And so the first one are the way of the day, um, the owl or night monkeys. And these are nocturnal. We'll talk a little bit more about these later. Our next group are the Tilidae. These are our spider monkeys, our woolly monkeys, our spider woolly monkeys, and our howler monkeys. Next, you have the Calatrithidae's which are your marmosets and your tamarins, the little one. Um, then you have your Cibidae, which are your capuchin monkeys and your squirrel monkeys. Uh, these are known for being pretty intelligent and living in larger groups. Uh, Calatrithids are known for uh, their fun fact, they've re-evolved cloths. Uh, and also uh, they generally give birth to twins. And then finally, we have our friends, the tea monkeys that are part of Pithecidae. So we're going to go on a tour and talk about some of our, our friends in the Amazon. Um, but I want to give you a theoretical background. Um, if for anything, if you ever are able to interact with people, you can watch these sorts of factors. And this is what my party game is. I'm a natural introvert. And so I'm often the one sitting behind and watching all the people interact. Um, and especially if there's food. And so my specialty, one of my specialties is actually feeding ecology. Um, surprise, surprise, I also like snacks. So in primatology, um, group structure is really, really important. And so one of the big questions is, why do primates live in groups? And what are the factors that influence their group size? Do they live in small family groups? Do they live in groups of 200 individuals? Are there males and females? Is it uh, a very strict hierarchy or not? And so this all starts with uh, ecological pressures. And so um, food and also quality of food. And so what that means is that uh, if you say like to eat leaves, um, leaves are everywhere, right? No one is ever going to fight for salad. And so you're not going to have competition uh, over salad, right? Think about that. However, if I bring in a chocolate cake, um, we could have some competition, right? And so it's defendable. It's high quality. I might actually invite my friends over to help defend that chocolate cake. Um, great thing for teachers. Well, maybe not a great thing for teachers, but uh, you can 
do some of these activities, uh, have fun size bars of candy bars versus say one big thing, and then have the kids try to figure out how to defend uh, their food resources. Predation is a, a big reason of why primates live in groups. And so um, one, there's the idea of selfish herd. And so uh, <laughs> if there's a predator and you're alone, guess who's gonna be lunch? However, if you are there with say 50 other people, you've just reduced your chances from one to one to one to 50. So, you know, it's that idea. You don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun your friend. So predation plays a big role in these sorts of things. So depending on the distribution of the food and what you're eating, if you're eating insects, if you're eating uh, high quality big fruits, if you're eating leaves, um, females then map onto the food resources. And so um, this is because as mammals, we require a lot of energy to reproduce, to produce milk, uh, to carry the offspring, and so we need food. Males then map on to females. Because for a male's reproductive success, it depends on his access to females. And there's oftentimes counter strategies. Um, this is one of those things that we oftentimes see uh, with infanticide. And so uh, if a male will kill offspring as a reproductive strategy, um, then that's something that then the female grouping will, will change about that. And then all those factors influence group size and social structure. So we're not gonna get into all the details of that. Uh, you'll have to take one of my primate classes for that, but it's just an interesting framework as we kind of talk about the different primates that live in the Amazon and their different social structures and thinking about how these things relate to their predation risk and also the distribution of their preferred foods. Okay. So in the Amazon, favorite question, Katie, what is that? <laughs> there are two questions that are extremely hard that should be so simple. How many animals live in the environment and what is it? So this is when we become interactive again. And so um, I have two animals here. Can anyone tell me who they are? Howlers, okay. TTs. Anyone know what species of TT they are? TT monkey. And are these the same species? Well, <laughs> got this question. Not the same species. Um, I, it was a little bit of a tricky picture because I put a black and white picture up here. Uh, and in some of these pictures I stole from um, our great collection of, of um, pictures from the alumni. But this isn't even a harder question. So um, I knew roughly that there were a couple of species of TD monkeys. Um, and then we're asked a lot of questions saw a couple of them, listened to a couple of them, read a whole bunch of articles, and the answer is it's complicated. So uh, TD monkeys are one of the most speciose primate species of the world. And so when we use that term, um, right now the estimates are about 34, depends on who you talk to. Um, we might see that number, I think about every year we have at least one new species, but then we also see reclassifications of these. So at least 34. So um, this alone, this one group of primates, uh, just blew all your estimates of how many primates are in Peru. Uh, granted, not all the TD monkeys live in Peru, so I guess we still don't quite know that answer. Um, they could be one genus or up to four now. Uh, so they used to be all called Calicebus. Not anymore. <laughs> um, and when we think about this biologically, 
Um, what is a species comes to a question. So our high school biology teachers, uh, you might use the biological species concept. There's actually about 10 different species concepts. So first we're always uh, arguing about what a species is and how do we define it? Does it need to be able to reproduce? Um, do we use morphology? Do we use genetics? Um, with genetics, it's making it sometimes clear, sometimes not. Um, so with TD monkeys, um, a lot of people have been looking at their morphology and that's what we used for a long time. Geographic locations was also a big factor. And so um, the TD monkeys that are in Northern Colombia um, might be different than the ones in southern Brazil. There's actually a couple of people that are looking at the vocalizations and other behaviors to determine what species are what. And then obviously uh, now we are able to start collecting genetics and provide evidence to that. And so um, right now, <laughs> um, this is the current idea of, of the TD monkeys. Now, thinking not only of species, but how do we have speciation events? Uh, we usually have a geographic barrier. And so for many of the primates that live in the Amazon, the rivers form a geographic barrier. So if you look at this map and you see the green versus the orange and the divide there, what's the thing that's dividing it? The Amazon River. Now, right here, this is a bonus point. What's the river dividing these two? It's a river you've all been on. Not the Sukasari, but you're really close, Lori. The bigger one. The Napo, yeah. And so, you know, the place that we go is one of these big geographic barriers. And so, depending on what side of the river we're on, we could see different species, which is super cool. Um, so um, looking at a couple of different things, most people believe that we have this one right here, uh, which would be on the Southern side, which is kind of interesting. Also, what used to be called Calcebus lucifer, um, also known as the yellow-handed monkey, um, which is in the green area, um, there are people that are saying that we have this one. I'm not sure, but I think that there are at least three TD monkeys at Napo. Um, I have no proof. <laughs> I need evidence. Um, so that was something that I was going to look at this summer um, because it, it's really interesting. So we have at least two different species. Um, specifically in the place that many of us have, have traveled to, um, but we might have more. And especially if we go across the Napo in both sides and then go a little bit further down and look at the Amazon versus not. Okay, a couple of fun facts about TT monkeys. Um, so these are actually from Southern Peru, um, I was spending every morning waking up at four trying to find them. Uh, they actually are territorial and they do these complex duets. Uh, because they're duets, I can't do it. I'll do a howler monkey for you before, uh, later on. And so you can do playbacks and they'll actually call back because they think that it's an intruding uh, set of animals. So I spent three months trying to find these guys. I got pictures of tails, and then we are leaving the Amazon, we are at the National Park st Station before we left, and then these two are just sitting there right by the visitor center, grooming each other. I'm like, of course. Anyways, um, fun fact about TD monkeys, so when they sleep, they oftentimes twirl their tails together, and they're highly monogamous. So much that uh, studies in captivity, um, you can measure stress response if you remove the partner or if you remove the ch the children. Um, most primate mothers, if you remove the children, they're going to be highly stressed. And TD monkeys, they're more upset about losing their partner than their children. 
Very interesting. Just going to throw that one out there and keep moving. Okay, next friend, uh, black mantle tamarinds. Uh, tamarinds also have um, some changing taxonomy, uh, but this is a little bit more stable. So they're part of this group called calotrypids. Um, they are different than most other primates because they usually give birth to twins rather than singletons. Uh, most primates usually have one baby per reproductive event. Uh, because of that, they live in these cohesive family structures and everyone takes care of the babies. And so I love um, with kids showing a picture of uh, an animal with babies and they say, oh, oh, who is that? And everyone's like, it's mom, it's mom. And they're like, nope, it's actually dad. And so dads oftentimes do a lot more of the caring uh, because mothers are spending a lot of energy uh, with lactation. My sister has twins and of course uh, I've studied tamarins. That was the first species I studied uh, back in my 20s, uh, but I have also been studying them more recently than that. And so gave her tons of information on calotrythids and she's like, Katie, these are children. These are not study species. I was like, Meh. Okay, I still do every once in a while fun games with my nephews. Um, again, you can kind of see from this picture, they have claws again. Uh, part of that might be because of their size compared to the trunk of trees. Um, they also tend to eat sap, um, and so the nail might help break that through. Okay, so most of you got this. Smallest primate, nope, sorry, I was wrong. Smallest monkey, it's the pygmy marmoset. They're about that big. Uh, these babies are about that big. Um, this picture was taken from one of my Peruvian students and he, I was writing the lecture at the field station. He came in, he yelled at me, Leoncito. I ran down the trail without even having my boots on. I was halfway there before I finally got my boots on. So Cameron, not, so he captured this picture. Um, it is, uh, so I think we did have a sighting of these uh, near Napo. Um, the fun thing is that their territory can be about five or six trees. I mean, they're, they're little bitty guys. Again, as you can see from the picture, part of calotrythids have twins. Um, also, um, gumnivory, so eating gums, is a, a main part of their diet. Oh, every once in a while, thank you, yes. Um, okay, owl monkeys, uh, also called night monkeys, are uh, the only nocturnal monkey. So there are a whole bunch of lemurs that are nocturnal, but there are no old world monkeys that are nocturnal. There are no apes that are nocturnal. So this is the only group of monkeys that is nocturnal. Uh, fun fact is that they weren't always nocturnal. And so if you see that their eyes are really big, uh, they actually don't have the part of the eye that helps with night vision. Um, so they were diurnal, active during the day, and then went back in. Um, yeah, the pygmy marmoset, uh, it's little lion. Uh, and so uh, I think because of their fun little hair and then the ito is uh, anything tiny in Spanish. Um, yeah, I've heard them. I have not seen them. So this is one of those pictures I had to get from the internet. Um, but I would love to try to find them. Um, they also are monogamous and also give birth to twins. So um, we don't see twinning in any of the old world monkeys or apes. Um, so this is something really interesting about Central and South American primates. Oh, uh, our friends, the squirrel monkeys. Okay, so when we're talking about group size, I think you all know, squirrel monkeys have much larger groups. Um, I've read reports that have said that their groups can be up to 200 individuals. So, um, Many people think this is because they eat insects, and so they don't have a resource that they can actually uh, defend and, and fight against, because otherwise there'd be too much inner group fighting for the food resource. So uh, getting 200 animals into a fruit tree, nah, not, not very fun. 
Um, you can see this one right here uh, is actually scent marking. And so although primates and monkeys don't um, use scent marking a lot, uh, <laughs> they, they do occasionally uh, do that. Yeah, 200 monkeys in that banana tree. Um, so I think I counted up to 30 before, um, but pretty intelligent. We also see differences uh, in the different species, uh, depending on the level of predation in there. And so smaller groups when there, there isn't predation. Um, again, I put a subspecies or another one that they're changing all the taxonomy. So uh, hopefully by the time that we can travel, I'm going to go through and going to try to get the best estimate of what we have and then go out in the field and vary it, verify it. Um, yeah, Colleen, I am a horrible monkey counter. Um, my field assistants always make fun of me because I'm like, ah, oh, five. And they're like, you want to try again, Katie? I'm like, eight? And then, yeah. So uh, this is probably why I was working with uh, Cameron groups for a while. I can count up to 10 usually. Um, this is one of those species that um, they haven't seen in the wild. So these are the capuchin monkeys. There's two different species. Um, very, very intelligent. So when you hear about tool use, um, they're usually talking about uh, different species of capuchin monkeys. Um, I like to say that they're so smart that they can actually play old world monkeys in films. Um, so Marcel from Friends was a capuchin monkey in The Hangover. Uh, they had this, uh, they had a capuchin monkey. It was supposed to be from Southeast Asia. Um, but uh, this is one of the species that they haven't seen at the lodges for a very long time. And um, who was telling me, I think it was Cesar, that um, they recently, last year, um, saw one or two. And so this is very exciting as we're talking about conservation and primates that we expect in the area and if they're coming back and what does that mean. Um, so we will, we will wait and see. Okay, I promised you all a howler monkey. Um, and so uh, howler monkeys are known for their sound. This is another thing that uh, I was up in the canopy and all of a sudden stopped and I was like, I think that's a howler monkey. Um, so they have a little bit of variation. Um, they can oftentimes sound like dinosaurs. Uh, my favorite thing was one day I was supposed to meet a student and she said, Katie, there's a big cat outside of my tent. I couldn't meet you to do birding because it's just right there, it's super scary. And then I played a recording. I was like, was this your big cat? And I said, like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, that was a, a group of monkeys. Um, they're usually more folivorous. Um, and so although they're one of the largest monkeys in the Amazon, um, they actually uh, get kicked out of fruit trees a lot. Um, and so that's kind of an a interesting thing. Uh, Remember Pam and her howler monkey? Oh, I think there's a story that I don't know that I'm going to need to know about. Um, we have woolly monkeys. Uh, these are oftentimes used as pets, also large um, item. And I forgot to tell you, so howlers, woolies, and spider monkeys are the group of animals that have the prehensile tail. And so those are the only monkeys that can actually truly hang from their tails. Um, squirrel monkeys and capuchin monkeys somewhat do it. They actually have fingerprints on the edge of their tail so you can individually tell them apart by the ridges on that tail and they hang from it, they grab fruit from it. Um, I think it'd be so cool to have a prehensile tail. So that's my fun fact about, about those. Uh, and then my last species I'm going to highlight, one of the favorite words in Spanish, guapo. Um, I have not seen the sake monkeys yet. Um, I've heard that they're around. Um, I think anyone went to Chuck E. Cheese, I think they look like one of the Chuck E. Cheese characters, but just beautiful animals. 
um, very, they haven't been studied a lot. There's probably about five researchers uh, in the world that have studied these. Um, one of the, the people that uh, partners with One Planet is one of them, um, but just super cool animals. Um, they're actually have these really interesting teeth because during times of food scarcity, they can break open really tough nuts. Okay, so for the sake of time, uh, pygmy marmosets, everyone gets a point. You guys rock that one. Um, the smallest primate in the world is actually um, the dwarf mouse lemur that lives in Madagascar. Um, super tiny, as you can tell from its name. So spider monkeys have actually lost their thumbs. Um, and so you can see this bone. They actually have a reduced thumb. They actually still have their thumb toes though. So a uh, very interesting thing about those guys. Got the owl or night monkeys. And we answered that one. So calatrithids can't hang by their tails. All old or monkeys can't. And obviously apes can't because we don't have tails. And estimates right now are about 66. Um, so it depends who you talk to. Um, I've seen estimates everything from 30 to um, 66 is the highest. So I'm sure by the time we get back into the Amazon, this will probably be up to 70. <laughs> nice try, Krista, six versus 66. I'll, I'll give it to you. Okay. So in our last couple minutes, um, bringing monkeys into the classroom. And all I use will say, oh, Kitty, I already had 30 monkeys in the classroom. I don't need any more. Well, um, let's bring some other monkeys into it. Uh, that's the joke that everyone hears when they say, oh, you're a primatologist. Oh, you can study my brother. or You can study my, my best friend. Um, so, we talk about phenomena, we talk about inspiring awe in our students, and you never know what's going to be that thing that changes their path. Um, I'm here today because of my sixth grade teacher and one of my high school biology teachers, um, and so never forget that you can make a difference. Um, but look at this guy, he's got a mustache. Uh, this is actually one of the species in, in southern Peru. Um, and so just bringing some joy and, and interest into your classroom. Talk about global and local collection. I'm a Midwesterner, so I grew up with squirrels my whole life. Um, it wasn't until I started studying primates would come back. Um, they have a similar sound they make in the trees when they rustle through and I'm like, what's that primate? And then I'm like, oh, it's just a squirrel. And then um, and especially this summer when I didn't get to visit my primate friends, um, I started watching the squirrels. And so there's so many great things that are happening in our own backyard that we can get people excited about these ideas in the Amazon and then bring those back home. I'm going to talk a little bit more about a way to do that. Um, but also when we talk about conservation and environmental ideas, so many of our actions that we're doing here in the US are impacting people around the world. Um, studying behavior. And so this is something that uh, isn't really mentioned in much of the K through 12 curriculum, but for NGSS standards, this process-based learning approach uh, means that you could do inquiries on animal behavior. Um, and so that's a great way of doing it. Um, primates respond to changes in a variety of different ways. So this is a great topic to talk about climate change, for example, uh, rain shifts, um, latitudinal shifts, changes in phenology and phenological mis mismatch. And a great example and a, a point um, to talk about ecology. Um, yes. I, that, that's one of the points that I, I would love. I would love some of those things. Um, so I've been hoping to set up a squirrel monkey squirrel curriculum 
Um, and so using some of the techniques that we have maybe from footage of our lovely squirrel monkeys and then figuring out ways how to study things in your backyard. Um, great ways, especially for digital learning. Um, many zoos have awesome webcams so your students can watch these animals around there. I only found one with New World uh, primates. Um, so I'm gonna talk to my zoo friends. I work with uh, eight zoos for you know, part of my program that I work with. And so see if we can get some New World primate Amazon species into some of these zoo camps. But you can study the things in your own backyard. So now that I work from home, it turns out that the house cat has been writing manuscripts this whole time. Never would have known that if I wasn't here to see this. Um, but you can study various things, have a really cool activity. Um, this is a great way to connect nature journaling. So you can journal outside, have them focus on something specific, um, have them watch ants. Ants are a great study species uh, if you can't study primates. And then I'm gonna throw this out there because you all are the experts. And so what other connections can you make? Um, would love to hear your ideas, would love to connect with partnerships, um, love to give you resources. Um, so anything that you have. So on that note, um, how can I help? Um, so I'm happy to, if you're interested, uh, do Skype a scientist and come and talk to your class. I'm happy to help outline how to study behaviors and get an ethogram going. And so you can um, scaffold this for your students to get them outside and away from screens if some of you are doing uh, virtual online learning. Um, anything else you can think of, let me know. Um, ooh, you know, it was funny. I was looking at NGSS and the one thing it's, I can talk <laughs> I could talk about mating, but you know, try to steer clear with certain audiences. Um, but um, that's one of the NGSS standards. I was like, oh, interesting. Um, life sciences and mating. And so, yeah, super interesting things um, with competition, uh, sexual dimorphism, um, um, yeah, great stuff. Uh, things I shouldn't admit, I love watching The Bachelor and Bachelorette, partly because, you know, as a primatologist who can't go in the field, the interactions between people for competitions on mates, good stuff. Um, but I want to thank you all for showing up and coming and inspiring me. Uh, it's one of those things that I love going to the Amazon and getting inspired by all the great things that you are doing. Um, and it helps me be a better scientist and a better teacher in my classrooms. And so um, thank you for taking this time in a very, very busy time to come listen and learn about some monkeys. And so if you have any questions, I'm happy to stay on. Um, feel free to unmute or turn on your video, um, but uh, thank you so much. Absolutely, Katie, thank you. This is, um... Fantastic. Um, you all can understand now why we, we love having Katie on the team. Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. We sure hope you enjoyed this session on Amazon Primates. If you'd like to tune in to future webinars, you can find the full calendar on our website at morphoinstitute.org slash webinars. And we'll also have links to the recordings from previous webinars on that page as well. So stay tuned and we look forward to seeing you online next month.